Welcome to MedEd's presentation of the CCRN Review. My name is Cammie Christie and I'm the speaker for all these modules for the review. Um, now we are going over <clears throat> the module cardiovascular and what we've done is divided into part one and part two. <clears throat> so at least you get a break. Now the most wonderful thing about taping is that you can turn me on and turn me off whatever time you want and come back to it and you still have all the information. So if you start to get tired or overwhelmed, just click off, go on and do something, come back, because you need to remember, pick your strengths and weaknesses, and then study, do the S word, study your weaknesses before you take the exam. So ready? Let's get started with the first part of cardiac. The purpose of the heart, <clears throat> remember, it, it is a pump, and the main purpose of this heart is to pump blood, you know, hemoglobin, to the cell. Now the heart does have some endocrine property, A and B, B and P, C and P, but there are no questions like that on the exam. All you have to really concentrate is on the right heart and the left heart, the structure and function. The right ventricle <clears throat> is actually a very thin ventricle. The septum really doesn't do anything for right ventricular contraction. The right ventricle, if you read about it, it has bellows action. It just goes like this. <clears throat> but you have to remember it's very low pressure and the job of the right ventricle and right atrium is to get capture all the venous blood from the head and neck from the SVC and all the rest of the blood from the body from the IVC <clears throat> that then comes to the right atrium. The right atrium pumps to the right ventricle and in normal people that normal low pressure right ventricle pumps this venous blood through the pulmonary vault, normal people low pressure and fills the left ventricle. So that's perfect. <clears throat> it just pumps this venous blood. The key is that it's low pressure because it should be pumping against pulmonary vascular resistance, which is low pressure. But what happens to your patient when they have an acute, isolated right ventricular infarction or right ventricular failure? And this usually happens very acutely. Will that patient have pulmonary edema? And the answer is no. When the right heart fails, remember, this is the right heart, it fails, so it dilates, and it's not pumping well, so it's not pumping blood to the pulmonary artery or to the lungs, so what happens, it dilates, the pressure gets high, then the pressure gets high on the right atrium, and now you will begin to see tachycardia, always tachycardia, JVD right away. And then later on, because the IVC gets filled, they get liver, a little bit of liver congestion, maybe ascites and peripheral edema. But that doesn't happen right away. So what you see in acute right ventricular failure is tachycardia, JVD, but the lungs are clear. They may drop their blood pressure because the right heart's not filling the left. So always remember that. <clears throat> now here's what I really want you to remember. When somebody has isolated right ventricular failure, the treatment is volume. You gotta give this patient fluid. And you'll say, I'll come to the bedside and say, okay, why don't you give two liters of fluid in 30 minutes? And go, Cammy, the patient has JVD. You're gonna put the patient in pulmonary edema. And I'm gonna give you the Cammy look and say, slap yourself. You can't get pulmonary edema from here. There's a couple of concepts here that are very important and which most nurses don't appreciate because when was the last time you had a patient with isolated right ventricular failure? You probably haven't, you probably haven't. It's not common. Most of your patients have biventricular failure, both ventricles are failing, and in those patients we do not give volume, we diurese them. So let's go back to this right ventricle. It's failing, but remember Frank and Starling, the Frank Starling law, the more you stretch the myofibrils, the better the heart contracts. Well, the right heart <clears throat> has a great potential to stretch and then contract better. So the answer on this test, and any test you ever take that talks about acute right ventricular failure, the treatment is volume. Keep it full so it will contract. Okay, good. The left ventricle <clears throat> is a little bit different because the left ventricle now is pumping against aortic pressure, much higher pressure. So the right ventricle, the left ventricle, sorry, the left ventricle is thicker and the septum becomes very important in left ventricular function. The right heart does this, the left heart does this. So that whole septum contracts to get blood out the aorta. Pressure in the left ventricle is much higher. So if the patient has left ventricular failure from a STEMI for whatever reason, the left ventricle dilates, pressure gets very high, 
the left atrium dilates, pressure gets high, and that's transmitted right to the pulmonary veins. They stretch, get high pressure, they leak, the capillaries fail, and now the patient has pulmonary edema. In that patient, you would stop giving fluid and give diuresis. So right and left ventricular failure are very different. So let's talk about this just for another second because there are some real good pearls of practice here. Mr. Smith is, you know, 75 years old, but he has smoked cigarettes since he was 20, and he smokes two packs a day. It's a huge history of smoking. He has COPD. So what has happened to his pulmonary pressures when you have emphysema? The pressures go up. <clears throat> so what has happened to his right heart? His right heart has gotten thicker and stiffer, pumping over all these years over higher and high pressure. So he has core pulmonal. So his right-sided pressures are very high. Now he gets pneumonia, community-acquired pneumonia. comes your ER, and he has pneumonia with sepsis because he has a dysregulated system, and he's hypotensive and hypoxic. And so what do we do for sepsis? Right, what do you do? We identify the sepsis. We get the chest x-ray. We get the blood cultures. We get everything. We start the antibiotics. We give fluid. We give fluid. But remember in the early sepsis protocol, they said put in a central line, measure the CVP, make sure it's 8 to 12. If it's 8 to 12, they're, they're tanked up. Well, Mr. Smith, when you put that CVP in him, he's going to have a CVP of 18. And that's his normal CVP because, remember, he has core pulmonale. So if your right heart is dilated, your right atrium is dilated, and the pressure goes up. But that's 18... CVP has nothing to do and it does not reflect the left ventricle. So if everybody comes in with a normal heart and lungs, then their CVP is reflective of their left side. But if they have lung problems, emphysema, asthma, they have COPD, they're hypoxic, they have pneumonia, that CVP may only be telling you about right-sided failure, not the left side. So that's an important thing to remember. In anybody who has sepsis, what's the treatment? Fluid. So even if his CVP was 18, he still needs fluid for sepsis. So right and left ventricular function and structure. <clears throat> the coronary arteries are very important. You know, you have your aortic valve and the aortic root right above the valve. Right above the valve is where the ostiums or openings of the coronary arteries are. The right coronary <clears throat> and 90% of people feeds the whole right atrium, the entire right ventricle, righty, and the top of the septum, the very top, one-third of the septum. And in 90% of all people, that right coronary artery wraps around behind the heart, behind the heart, and feeds the inferior wall of the left ventricle. Aha, that's important. So if you've got a patient that came to you with an <clears throat> inferior wall STEMI, it's the right coronary artery. Now that's just anatomy, and there aren't too many anatomy questions on the exam, but what they might ask you is, you are admitting a patient with a right, you know, an inferior wall STEMI, what dysrhythmia might you anticipate? There's a lot of questions about anticipation or what do you think is gonna happen next? So in an inferior wall of mine, you know, what's the right coronary? The right coronary feeds the SA node, the AV node, and the bundle. So the most common dysrhythmias are bradycardia and first-degree heart block. You have to remember that. The left coronary artery that you see here, you have the left main, and then it bifurcates. The top artery there, the left circumflex, that feeds the left atrium and the high lateral left ventricle. So if you get a patient with an anterior lateral <clears throat> infarction, you know it's a circumflex. But pay special attention to that left anterior descending, that huge artery that goes all the way down. That feeds two-thirds of the septum. Please remember how important the septum is to the left ventricle. The whole anterior part of the heart and the apex, that little part on the very bottom, that apex, that's important. The purpose of that is to push blood out the aorta. So if somebody has an anterior lateral, anterior septal, anterior apical infarct, what is the most likely dysrhythmia? VTAC and VF, right? Now, everything on the exam that has anything to do with rhythm or, ryth or dysrhythmias is ACLS. So your patient goes into VTAC. You go running in there because the first thing in ACLS is check your patient. 
well, the patient's sitting in the chair, drinking a cup of coffee, reading a newspaper. And you go in there, and he is in VTAC, wide complex tachycardia. He's in VTAC. What are you going to do? Well, what I'm going to do is take away the coffee and the newspaper. And, you know, I really like people when they die to die in bed, not in the chair. So I'm going to put him in bed. I'm going to put his head of the bed up. I'm going to get the defibrillator. Um, uh, um, oh, now I'm having a stroke. Defibrillator, cardioverter, your, your life pack. I'm going to put the patches on while I call the doctor. You're going to call a doctor. And the doctor says, well, if he's awake and alert and he has blood pressure, it can't shock him. So what drug would you give him? And ACLS, what drug do you use for VTAC? Amiodarone. So you start the amiodarone. Ten minutes later, the patient is still in VTAC. So you call the doctor back. The patient's still in VTAC. Okay, I'll be right there. Now he comes in or she comes in, and you can cardiovert the person, righty, with conscious sedation. So you've got to use whatever you use for conscious sedation to cardiovert. Remember with conscious sedation, sedation is not analgesia. So you always want to remind the doctor you want some fentanyl. You want some, not usually not morphine, but fentanyl or a little dilaudid, a little bit. Because after you shock them, they're going to wake up from their sedation and be in pain. Right? Now, if you run in and the patient VTAC is compromised, they have no blood pressure, you will cardiovert them. If they're in V-fib, they should look dead. They should look dead. If they're awake and alert, they've been scratching with their wires or pulling their wires or doing something goofy. If they're in V-fib, they will be dead. And the first thing you do is call for help and begin CPR. The best thing you can do for people is good, fast CPR. Okay, good. VTAC and V-fib. Dysrhythmias. Now, here's a picture of the coronaries. And you can see that the aortic valve then there's the root, then the osteums, the ascending arch of the aorta. There are two primary things that, that <clears throat> regulate the coronary artery circulation. One is the patient's rate. The only time blood flows through those coronaries is during ventricular diastole, when the heart is resting, the ventricle is resting. The aortic valve is closed and the heart is resting. So we like people who have coronary disease to have heart rates in the 60s, don't we? So they have a long diastolic time to fill the ventricle and the coronaries. The second most important thing to determine coronary blood flow is diastolic blood pressure. Now remember, the aortic valve is closed, the heart is resting. So the pressure in the aorta in diastole is 80, right? 120 over 80. So right here, the pressure is 80. And if you look down those coronaries, you see big fat coronaries, and then you see those little tiny arterioles that go into the inside part of the muscle. If you went to one of those little tiny arteries, the pressure inside those little subendocardial arteries is only 10 millimeters of mercury. So you have a pressure gradient. In the aorta where the osteums are, the pressure is 80, and down here at the tip where the artery ends, it's only 10. So that's a high, low pressure, and blood will go right down that coronary just like a waterfall. Perfect. But Mr. Smith, he's a 65-year-old man in your neighborhood. He's a high-powered attorney, and he drinks daily, a lot of drinks. And he has developed esophageal varices and cirrhosis. So this morning he goes to his office, and at 9 o'clock in the morning, one of his varices ruptures, and now he's barfing blood all over. Secretary calls 911. He's in your ER, and he is profusely bleeding. His heart rate is 120, 125, sinus tack, but his blood pressure is 60 over 40. Now, really, if you've ever worked in the ED and somebody comes in bleeding, what's our goal? stop the bleeding. So we need to start some big boy IVs. We need to start resuscitating because the only way to stop an esophageal bleed is to get GI to come and band ligate or sclerose that, that vessel. And you know what? They don't live in your ER, so it takes time. So we get everything done. We resuscitate. E, a GI comes. They take everything down. He stops bleeding. He has a blood pressure, and we send him to the step-down unit. And he's okay, but the next morning he begins to have some PVCs, and he just doesn't feel good. His pressure's a little soft, so you get another EKG. And you compare it to on admission and say, oh, my God, when did he have this STEMI? He had it when he was so hypotensive. So we now remember diastolic time and diastolic pressure.
So diastolic time, when your heart rate is 125, how much time do you have during diastole? Very little. So he has low, uh, a, a, a shorter amount of time to fill. And what's his blood pressure? 60 over 40. So instead of 80 over 10, his diastolic is 40. And his end diastolic in those little tiny vessels not 10 anymore because his heart is beating 125. So that goes up to 15. So does he have a good pre pressure gradient for flow? No. And he sustains an acute STEMI. Acute STEMI. Oh my gosh, he's had a STEMI. Let's take him to the cath lab. <clears throat> take him to the cath lab. And his coronaries are clean as a whistle. The man's an alcoholic. You know, God takes care of fools and drugs. He has no coronary disease. Did he have an infarct? Yes. Supply and demand. Please remember module number one. What do we always try to do? Improve supply, decrease demand. Well, the demand for oxygen and a heart rate of 125 and no blood pressure is very high. He couldn't get the, the oxygen there, so he had a STEMI. Now, it's a good thing he doesn't have coronary disease because can you imagine putting a stent in this man? What drugs would he be on? Aspirin and Plavix in a GI bleeder. And, and somebody who has multiple varices, it's probably not a good idea. Not a good idea. So how does your heart get blood? during diastolic time, diastolic pressure. And that's called coronary artery perfusion pressure, CAP, C-A-P-P. -P. On your exam, you do not need to know equations. But I put this here because the most important piece of this equation is coronary artery perfusion pressure equals diastolic pressure minus pulmonary wedge. Well, you're never going to have a wedge, but you have a diastolic pressure. If the patient who's having chest pain and you're giving nitro and morphine to drops their diastolic below 60, they're not, fit, they're, they're not getting enough oxygen to the heart, so we're making them worse. So the thing to remember about somebody in active chest pain is we want the pain to go away, nitro, but titrate that morphine so we don't drop his diastolic blood pressure because that's how he gets blood to his heart. All right, diastolic pressure. Now this is in the operating room. Uh, I work with cardiac surgery, remember, and this is a big OR bucket. And so this is not an autopsy. This is a heart transplant. This is a young man. He's only 18 years old who has idiopathic cardiomyopathy. Remember, what does idiopathic mean? It makes an idiot of you and me and a pathetic patient. We can't figure out why he has it, but he does. And if you look, look carefully at that picture. He's got beautiful coronary arteries. And then you see them on the epicardium on the outside. He only has a little bit of fat. And then you see where the artery kind of disappears. That's where it dives down into the subendocardium. Those are those little tiny vessels. So that, that is a neat. Now the reason the scrub tech is still pointing to that heart is because it's been out of the body for about seven minutes and it's still fibrillating. It's still shaking in the bucket. Kind of eerie. But it's a very good picture, very good picture. Now, this young man who got the transplant had normal coronary arteries. He had idiopathic cardiomyopathy. This is the most important slide, the m most important slide, because everything in cardiology hinges on this slide. We always talk about the determinants of ventricular function. What do we look at? What can we manipulate to make the patient have a better cardiac output? Now, you can Google determinants of ventricular function and find 30 slides just like this. And you know what? They're all wrong. They're all missing something. So I need you to add something to this slide. Cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. That, that's what every book says. But it should say heart rate and rhythm. Rhythm. And the reason I say that is because you could have a patient in a sinus rhythm with a ventricular rate of 80. And they're fine. They have a perfect blood pressure, cardiac output, kidneys perfused, brain, everything's fine. But they slip into atrial fib with a ventricular rate of 80. What happens to their cardiac output? Goes down. So heart rate and rhythm. Anything on the test about rhythm is ACLS. So if you need to, review your ACLS guidelines. What do you do for VTAC? What do you do for atrial fib? What do you do for bradycardias, sinus bradycardias? What do you do for heart block? You need to remember your algorithms for all those meds. So that goes under heart rate and rhythm. And actually in cardiac, the first thing I assess when somebody has a low blood pressure is, what's their heart rate and rhythm? Okay, good. Now let's look at stroke volume. Stroke volume is divided into three things, preload, afterload, and contractility. 
Preload is the easiest concept to understand because preload is the amount of volume in that ventricle before contraction. So if you want a good cardiac output, that ventricle has to be filled, has to have volume, and has to contract and get the blood out. So, for example, you get a patient transferred to you from the floor. Not the med search floor, it's a little tiny old, old lady. She's 85 years old. Unfortunately, she got C. diff. She's been pooping like a goose. She's not taking anything PO. She feels nauseated. She's very dehydrated. So her preload is very low. Her cardiac output is low and her blood pressure is low. So what would you anticipate doing? Replacing that volume. So you give her that volume. Her preload comes up. Her cardiac output comes up. We're all good. We're all good. But not all of your patients are volume depleted. They probably could be hemodiluted or volume overloaded. Mighty. Think of all your heart failure patients. And on the last test I took, I had 10 questions on heart failure, just heart failure. So remember the leading diagnosis for or anybody being admitted to the hospital is heart failure. So if their preload is too high, what's their cardiac output? It's still low. So how do you get rid of the volume? You diurese the patient. Lasix, Bumex, Xeroxylin, what, what, whatever drug you want, you'll diurese them, decrease their preload, their cardiac output comes up. But here's a problem. Mr. Smith has been coming to you every 12 or 14 weeks for the last year. He has heart failure and he decompensates easily. Now, let's step back and talk about heart failure for just a second. We'll, we'll come back to it later, but let's talk about it for a second. <clears throat> Heart failure is a progressive disease. It never gets better. 65% of all patients diagnosed with heart failure are dead in five years. It's a horrible, horrible disease. And what happens, cardiac output begins to drop, renal perfusion begins to drop, so they have heart failure, renal failure, their liver is failing, their lungs are full of fluid, so that's really multi-system organ failure. It's not a good thing to have. And here's the real problem. No matter what we do, besides a transplant, I can't make you live any longer. No matter if I give you a biventricular pacer, the new pacing, all the new pacing stuff, I give you all preload, afterload, contractility, no matter what I do for you, I can't improve your survivability. So our goals on heart failure really are to improve the quality of life until they can get their transplant or what, what device they're going to get. Okay. So heart failure, the preload is always high, right? But Mr. Smith comes to you every 10 weeks, 12 weeks. So he's here today. He has bibasal arouse. And now he does not have an increased heart rate because he's on a beta blocker. His blood pressure is a little soft. He's looking pretty bad. He had to put him on two liters nasal cannula because his stats were only, you know, 90%. So you call the doctor and say, well, Mr. Smith is admitted again. And the doctor says, well, give him some Lasix. And you said, well, the last time he was here, 10 weeks ago, his creatinine was 1. Today, his creatinine is 5.5. Oh, he's going into renal. He's got AKI. We're going to have trouble. So give him 5 of Bumex and see what happens. And what do you say to that? And not out loud, but in your head, you go, oh, that's not going to work. So you give Mr. Smith 5 of Lasix, milligrams of Lasix IV push. Uh, excuse me, 5 of Bumex IV push. Give him the Bumex. Remember that Bumex is a loop diuretic just like Lasix, but it's much more potent. And when you give Lasix, you should start seeing urine or output in about 20 minutes. 20 minutes, you should be fine. But in Bumex, what happens? You give Bumex and you don't see a response for an hour and a half, two hours. So you give the Bumex. At the end of two hours, Mr. Smith has made 12 cc's of urine. He has rouse up to here. You got him on a 40 or 60% Benny mask. And you call the doctor and say, well, that was very successful. The patient now is not in decompensated heart failure. He's in pulmonary edema. He's not made any urine. So the question on your test is, what can you use? What's another preload reducing agent? Not dibutamine, not milrinone. A preload reducing agent that you can give a patient who's in renal failure. It doesn't, it's not a diuretic. It's called a vasodilator, and the drug of choice is nitroglycerin. So you're going to give IV nitroglycerin because what that does is dil excuse me, dilate all the peripheral vessels so you have decreased venous return and you unload the heart. 
is very important. You're going to have a question on cardiogenic shock. How do you make that patient better? How, how do you preload, reduce a patient in shock? You can't diurese them. You use a little bit of nitro. And here's what everybody says. Oh, Kemi, their blood pressure is too low. You can't use nitro. Their blood pressure is low because their cardiac output is low. So if I decrease that preload and make the cardiac output come up, they won't lose their blood pressure. So to preload reduce somebody, you use a diuretic or a vasodilator nitroglycerin. So let's recap, preload. If you don't have enough, if you're dehydrated, your preload is low, your cardiac output's low, you give volume, piece of cake. If your preload is high, your volume overloaded, and your cardiac output is low, you diurese or vasodilate with nitro, cardiac output comes up. Perfect, perfect. So preload is easy. After load, the actual definition, and don't write this down, just listen, the definition of afterload is impedance to ventricular emptying. And you say, oh, can we say it in English? After, afterload is the work that the heart has to do to get blood out. So for your test, the only thing that we're talking about is the left ventricle. So afterload of the left ventricle is the aortic valve area. And you know, it's a terrible thing. If we all live long enough, we will all develop aortic stenosis. The number one valvular disease in the United States is aortic stenosis. So it happens over time. The aortic valve, which is nice and big, will get smaller, 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 and the ventricle has to pump against higher and higher resistance. So it gets thicker, thicker, stiffer, stiffer, and it uses a lot of energy. Patients usually complain of atrial fib, shortness of breath, maybe syncope. So what do we do? We give them a new aortic valve. And you may have a question about a TAVAR, a transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And generally, in the United States, TAVARs are only given to people who have been deemed a non-surgical candidate. So they can't go in and get <clears throat> a new aortic valve the traditional way. Either they're too sick, they have too many complications, they're a smoker, COPD, bad diabetic, that they're just not a good candidate for regular uh, uh, aortic valve surgery. So we do a TAVAR. They just go through the femoral artery, femoral vein, and the femoral vein up through the aorta. They balloon open that aortic valve and place a valve in valve. And um, what's, what's amazing is that 80% of these people go home on post-op day number two. They do very well. They do very well. Unfortunately, what happens to the other 20%? They have more complications. They have a stroke. As they balloon up that aortic valve, where does some of that calcium go? It flicks off and they get a big stroke. They have vascular access problems. They are bleeding. They get hematomas. They get a valve put in that becomes incompetent. And now instead of AS, they have AI, aortic insufficiency. So they're more short of breath. So 80% do great, 20% don't do so well, and many of them die within the first 30 days. But remember that this was the only, only option for them. So that's a TAVAR, righty? The other part of afterload is SVR, systemic vascular resistance. Normal SVR is 800 to 1400. So on the test, if they tell you your patient has a, an SVR of 2800, you're, your eyeballs are going to roll and you're going to say, well, that's not good because the higher the SVR, the lower the cardiac index. They're reciprocal. They're opposite. So the higher your SVR, the lower your cardiac index. So how do we reduce that SVR? It's medications. Now, NIPRIDE has not been on the test for a long time. Many, many institutions don't even have NIPRIDE anymore. So we have to go by the ABC drugs. It's very easy to remember. The afterload reducing drugs, A's, the first one is an ACE inhibitor. ACE inhibitors are the best. However, there's a group of the population that can't take ACE inhibitors because they get that angioedema. They have a horrible cough. They cough all the time morning, noon, and night in any position. So it's not position related, day or night related. They just cough all the time. So you have to stop the ACE inhibitor. So the next drug to give them is an ARB, angioreceptor uh, blocker, like um, Cozar, you know, um, Diavan, those drugs. 
Are they as good as an ACE inhibitor? No, but they're very good. If you can't take an ACE, you take an ARB, angioreceptor blocker. The other A drugs is an alpha antagonist. A pure alpha agent would be neosinephrine. I give you 200 mics of neo and you're gonna clamp down tighter than a tick, your SVR goes up. So this is the opposite. We're an afterload reducer, we're gonna relax that arterial muscle, so we give an alpha antagonist, relax. Probably the one you use most often is hydralazine. 10 to 20 milligrams IV, Q2 hours, PRN, whatever you want the blood pressure to be, and we love that drug because it works well. The problem with hydralazine is when the patient goes home, they have to go on hydralazine PO. And you know what? That's every six hours or every eight hours. So three or four times a day you have to take it. It's a wonderful drug, but has a very short half-life, so you have to give it frequently. You know, we can't get patients to take medicines once a day, let alone three or four times a day. So it's great, it works wonderful if you have a compliant patient. The other alpha antagonist is clonidine, and clonidine be given as a patch. So that's a very nice alternative. So after load reducing drugs that start with A, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, alpha antagonists. On the exam, they use a classification of drugs, not the drug name. So you don't have to learn 50 names, just learn the classification. The B drugs are all the beta blockers. Now, if your patient has coronary arteries, artery disease and or heart failure, they should be on a beta blocker. So if your grandfather you know, has coronary artery disease and you go visit and you look at his meds and he's not on a beta blocker, you have to find out why. Why is he not on a beta blocker? The C's are the calcium channel blockers. Probably the one we use most in cardiology is Norvasc. Why? It's a great drug and it's once a day. So Norvasc, that's a great drug. <clears throat> it's a great drug. However, you can only use Norvasc, a calcium channel blocker, in people who have an EF of 25% or greater. You can't use it. If you have a patient, you know, a repeat patient, you know, a, a chronic patient with an EF of 10%, you can't give them Norvasc because all of the calcium channel blockers make you hold on to salt and water. Yeah, so that's very, very important. Now let's talk about what if the afterload is very low? What if the patient's all vasodilated? Well, if you're all vasodilated, you have a great cardiac index, but you have no blood pressure. So anaphylaxis, things that are gonna just make you all dilate up, you know, is gonna give you a very low afterload, sepsis. And what's the first line drug for sepsis to vasoconstrict? Levofed or norepinephrine. The second is vasopressin, so levovaso. Those are the two major ones for sepsis. If your patient just got some drugs, they just came out of anesthesia and they're a little hypotensive, anesthesia loves neosinephrine, neo. So it's very easy to remember the three vasoconstrictors, levo, vaso, neo. You can use any of those. The fourth one is dopamine, but if you're gonna vasoconstrict with dopamine, the dose is 10 to 20 mics per kg. Personally, I don't like that drug because as I go up to 10 mics per kg per minute in dopamine, what always happens to the heart rate? It goes up. And remember, you fill your coronaries and you fill your ventricle at diastolic time. So the faster your heart rate is, you don't have as good a filling. So it may not be the best thing. And sometimes dopamine can be arrhythmiogenic when people get VTAC. Okay, good. So those are your drugs for preload and afterload. But I wanna step back now and talk about heart failure again. Mr. Smith, EF of 10%. We get his kidneys all better, his kidneys are fine, so he's being discharged in, with chronic heart failure. He has chronic heart failure. So how do we reduce preload? We put him on a low salt diet, remember low salt, or modified salt. We give him Lasix, potassium, and aldactone. Aldactone, everybody remembers as a potassium sparing a diuretic, but really aldactone is an aldosterone blocker. So it's a neurohormonal that blocks aldosterone from your head so you don't hold on to salt and water. So we preload reduce, cardiac output comes up. In heart failure patients, their afterload is very high, very high. So we have to afterload reduce them, and the drugs of choice are beta blockers, ACE inhibitors.
So now I'm doing preload and afterload and their cardiac output comes up a little bit. Now remember, I can't make them increase their survival. However, what we can do is improve their quality of life. From a class four heart failure, we can get them to a class three or a class two, class two heart failure. So that's excellent, that's excellent. Now they go home, Mr. Smith goes home and he's in the heart failure clinic and he's doing very well and he calls me about three months later and says, Cammie, I'm gaining weight. Now anybody in heart failure that gains weight, we always think that's volume, they're, they're retaining fluid. He's taking all his preload, he's taking all his afterload. He, we know because he has a wife that helps him, takes all his medicines. So now I have to add a contractility medicine, help him squeeze a little better. And the only PO medicine we have available for these patients is DIG. Now a lot of your doctors don't like DIG. And the, I think the reason DIG has such a bad reputation in heart failure is that DIG is cleared by the kidney. And if you're in heart failure, you often develop AKI and renal failure, and so people get DIG toxic, right? But DIG, the two primary inotropic drugs we have on the market are milrinone and dibutamine. They're both excellent. They're both vasodilators. They both increase contractility. Why one doctor wants one, the other doctor wants another, is wherever they went to doctor school, that's what they learned. The other important thing is, what does the patient's insurance pay for? So we're gonna send this, we're gonna put a pick line in them, send them home on a dibutamine drip, only if their insurance pays for dibutamine. Maybe it only pays for milrinone, but they're both excellent. And the last one is dopamine, but at five mics per kg. Right? So what we've just talked about is how we manipulate and how we use drugs to improve cardiac output. So on heart failure and all your STEMIs, your non-STEMIs, even people with hypertensive crisis, people with endocarditis, anything that you see on the test with valvular disease is heart failure, heart failure patient. So you have to think about these three things. Now remember you have that piece of paper, so when you get into your cubby, you can write this little thing, stroke volume equals heart rate and rhythm times stroke volume, and under stroke volume, preload after low contractility. One of my favorite questions on the exam is, you are admitting a patient with acute decompensated heart failure, pulmonary edema, which drugs do we anticipate using? And when you look at the answers A, B, C, and D, each one has three drugs. Please do not pick Lasix, Bumex, and Xeroxylin, because all you're giving them is a preload reducer, diuretic. So pick one diuretic, one preload reducer, one afterload reducer, and one contractility. So make sure you have one of each in the answer. Be very good. So this is very important. We've talked several minutes now about this and you need to make sure you understand these drugs and the, the combinations of the drugs that we use. You'll be happy to know that murmurs were taken off the test. Yay, no murmurs. But they may ask you about an S3 or S4. <clears throat> S3s and S4s are always pathologic and S3 always tells you that the patient is volume overloaded. It's an early diastolic sound. And S4 is a late diastolic sound, and it always tells you that the ventricle, the left ventricle, is non-compliant or stiff, aortic stenosis, hypertension. They're all, S3 and S4, always pathologic. S3, volume overload. S4, thick ventricle, decreased compliance. Very good, very good. Now, hemodynamics, you know, most intensive cares do not use PA catheters much anymore because most of our intensivists use ultrasound, which is non-invasive, very, very good parameters. They do not have test questions regarding the visual LEO or, you know, the SVV. There is nothing like that on the test. But they still have a few questions on a pulmonary artery catheter. Righty. So the use and the function, we've been using them since 1975. The problem is people have gotten out of use and it, do, it requires a stick. The patient needs a central line and a catheter going into their pulmonary artery. Righty. So I think the thing that most will help you on the exam is to think about the heart and the embryo. As the embryo is developing, the heart starts as a tube. So the pressure here, the pressure here, the pressure here, the pressure here, it's all the same pressure. It's all the same pressure. 
But now the heart begins to fold on itself and evolve into two atrium with a, with a septum, two ventricles with a septum, your valves, and a pulmonary artery and an aorta. So it evolves over this. But this is what I want you to remember. In true diastole, all the chambers are relaxed and the valves are all open. All the chambers in the heart have a pressure of 8 to 10. The right atrium, 8 to 10. The right ventricle, diastolic pressure, 8 to 10. The PA, D, diastolic, 8 to 10. The wedge, 8 to 10. They're all the same. They're all the same. But when the heart starts contracting and the valves start opening and closing, you see differences in the pressure. So we put a PA catheter in. We go in the right IJ. It goes right into the CVP. The CVP is 8 to 10. That's a normal CVP. Alrighty. You drop that catheter into the right ventricle with the tricuspid valve open. That, that right ventricle has a pressure of 25 over 8 to 10. The diastolic is the same. Look at this picture here. And on the very left, look at the right atrium. Look at the right ventricle. Look at the tricuspid valve is open. So those two chambers, the right atrium and the right ventricle, are communicating. They have to be the same pressure. They have to be the same pressure. So 8 to 10, 25 over 8 to 10. Now you blow up the balloon, and it floats out into the pulmonary artery. The pressure in the pulmonary artery is 25 over 8 to 10. Now, here's what I want you to remember. The PA pressure tells me the pressure in the lung parenchyma, the alveolar and capillary bed. That's the pressure there. So if the patient had pneumonia, if the patient was hypoxic, because that causes pulmonary artery and vein constriction, if the patient has COPD, asthma, what happens to the pressure in the lung? They go up. So the PA pressure would go up in response to hypoxemia, pneumonia, COPD, or disease. But normal is 25 over 8 to 10. So now you could have 45 over 25. Those are high pulmonary pressures, and the patient has pulmonary hypertension. Okay, good. That's what the PA tells you. Now you wedge that catheter, you blow up the balloon, it slides a little forward, and the, the tip of the catheter, the tip of the catheter is what measures the pressure. Now it's stuck there, so it, it blocks all the right-sided pressures, and it looks down the pulmonary artery, all the way down the pulmonary capillary, all the way to the pulmonary vein, all the way back to the left heart. There are no valves in there. So when you wedge the catheter, that measurement, 8 to 10, tells you about the filling pressure of the left atrium. So the PA tells you about the lungs. The wedge tells you about the left atrium. So you could have a PA pressure of 40 over 15, 40 over 18, and a wedge of 2. That would tell me that the pulmonary pressures are high for whatever reason, pneumonia, whatever, PEEP. But the filling pressure on the left is low. They need volume. Exactly. 8 to 10. Now, let's have a special cami catheter and go to the left atrium. The left atrial pressure is 8 to 10. Get that catheter down into the left ventricle. Left ventricular pressure is 120, systolic pressure, over 8 to 10. The LVEDP, left ventricular and diastolic pressure, is 8 to 10. So what am I telling you? In true diastole, all the pressures are the same. Very good. Very good. So this is the way we kind of separate. And you can see on the left side of your picture, you have the right heart, the pulmonary artery, the only artery in the body that has venous blood, to the lung, pumps it to the left ventricle. Now we're on the right side. The right ventricle pumps it to the capillary bed. VO2 is oxygen demand. What, what are you demanding? Now remember, what are our goals in anything critical care? Enhance oxygen delivery, decrease oxygen demand. How do I measure oxygen delivery to your, to your periphery? Well, usually I just get an ABG and I look at the direct saturations. So I know in a perfect person that your hemoglobin is 100% saturated. So I know I have a good hemoglobin, a num good number of hemoglobin, the pH is normal, the blood sugar is normal, so I know that I am delivering 100% of the oxygen available to the periphery or to your cells. But how do I measure, what do I measure to measure your oxygen consumption?
I get a venous saturation from the pulmonary artery from the PA catheter, and that tells me how much you've consumed. So in the pulmonary artery, it's venous blood, and the venous sats of that, if you did an ABG or a VBG, venous blood gas on that, it would be 70%. So that means I'm delivering 100%, but I'm only using 30% of the available oxygen. That's why when you do CPR, you don't have to worry about oxygenating the patient for six minutes. After six minutes, somebody's got a bag, all right? So I deliver 100%, I only use 30. That's an important guideline, important guideline. So when you look at the SVO2s, the venous gas of the pulmonary artery, it tells you normal is 60 to 80. So it tells me about cardiac output, tells me about H and H. Your patient's bleeding to death, what's gonna happen to the SVO2? It'll drop. You're not delivering, but it looks like you're extracting a lot because there's not there. Your H and H, you're dropping your H and H. You're dropping your oxygen, your, your SVO2 would be low, and metabolic demand. Patient has a fever, they shiver, they're in pain, they're angry. What happens to their demand? It goes up. So in the 70s, what we learned, nurses learned at the bedside when we finally got a PA catheter. Now, please notice that I'm not saying a Swan-Gans catheter. Dr. Swan and Dr. Gans are dead. So it's an Aero catheter, it's an Edwards catheter, it's a pulmonary artery catheter, PAC. So with, the, with that catheter, we could at the bedside determine oxygen demand. Very important piece. And so nurses learned a lot when we change positions, suction the patient, change their uh, gowns, bathe them, um, do a dressing change, their SVO2s drop. So what we learned is not to do everything at five o'clock in the morning, you need to settle out your nursing procedures so that you don't drop their SVO2. Oh, the monitor. You know, I, I think this is very funny. If I ask you, now, I want you to answer me as you normally would, not book answer. What's the first thing you do when you walk into a room? Your friend calls you and says, come here, help, right away. What's the first thing you do? First thing I do is look at the monitor. Oh, Kemi, I look at the patient first. No, you don't. As you're running in, you look at the monitor, and for two seconds, you're looking at the monitor, heart rate, rhythm, maybe O2 sat, maybe a blood pressure, maybe you have hemodynamic monitoring, an arterial line. You capture so much data, rate and rhythm, blood pressure, respiratory rate, O2 sat, and tidal CO2, and then you go to the patient. So heart rate and rhythm is very important. Please remember about the electrolyte lecture. So right now I'm just going to talk about electrolytes and the heart. That's all. But remember that electrolyte lecture. So this is my favorite question. When was the last time you did this to determine somebody's calcium? Never. Put a blood pressure cuff off and see tetany? No, we don't do that. If we need to know what a potassium is, we send the serum potassium. Uh, any electrolyte we send. But on the test, they're going to ask you, what are some of the signs and symptoms of hypokalemia, hyperkalemia? So I'm going to go over just the, enzyme, the electrolytes with the heart, but you're going to have to review those electrolytes. Please, two or three times read over that before you take the test, before you take the test. So hypokalemia, low potassium, is a ventricular irritant, isn't it? The, the lower the potassium, patient will have more PVCs, maybe even VTAC and VF. <clears throat> but what they're going to ask you is, what do you see on the EKG? So look at the top line of these two EKGs. At the top line, you have a normal QRS and T wave. And then you see that the K is getting lower and lower and lower. This is so easy to remember. A low K will give you a flattened or low T wave. The T wave kind of disappears with a very low potassium, right? So remember, that's going to change your QT interval. And you start getting a U wave, and it makes you have, you know, re-entrant phenomena or VTAC. So what do you do for, for a, a low potassium? You get potassium. But if they have a 25 in their thumb, I don't think you're going to get very much. So in a peripheral IV, hopefully a good one, 10 MEQs an hour. In a central line, 20 MEQs an hour but you can always give 60 MEQs PO an hour and raise that potassium. 
the potassium that you give, the reason people don't like it because it upsets their stomach is because it's an acid. But the key is it absorbs right through the stomach wall, goes right into your bloodstream. So it doesn't have to go to the liver to be metabolized. So that's why when you give potassium PO, you see a really good result. So if you can get the patient not to vomit when you give them potassium, that's a good thing. So hypokalemia. Hyperkalemia, high potassium, is a ventricular depressant. Patient's going to get bradycardic, maybe widen out their QRS, go asystolic. Now, what are you going to see on the EKG? Now, look at the bottom EKG. Remember, a T wave should be asymmetrical and rounded. Look at that T wave. It's not asymmetrical, and it looks like a tent, a tented T wave, or what some people call a hyperacute T wave, hyperacute. And you would see that in every lead. When there is an electrolyte dysfunction, you see it in every lead. Every single lead, you'll see that. So here's a very important clinical point. Your patient says, nurse, I'm having chest pain. Well, the first thing you usually do is get a 12 lead. You get a 12 lead, and you see tented T waves in 2, 3, and AVF, and that's it. Well, 2, 3, and AVF are your inferior leads. And if you see a tented T wave in facing leads, two facing leads, that is an early sign of ischemia. If they have hyperkalemia, that tented T wave will be in every lead, every single lead. Okay, good, good. Now, what do you do for high potassium? You call me and say, Kemi, the K is 5.5. Well, I have a sense of humor. I always say, don't give me any more potassium. Maybe we could just give 20 of Lasix IV, 20 milligrams of Lasix IV, and they'll pee it out. Well, that would be good. But the most common cause of hyperkalemia in the hospital setting is renal failure. So you give the 20 of Lasix and you call me back two hours later and say, well, that was very successful. The patient didn't pee and now their K is 6.5. Most common thing, you could give K excite enemas. The most common thing in a hurry, especially in the middle of the night, is to give an amp of D50, 10 units of regular insulin, some amount of bicarb, I have a calculation to figure out the bicarb, and albuterol, do you use albuterol? Albuterol is 20 grams inhaled, so you can do that very quick. Now 20 grams of albuterol is a lot of albuterol, the patient will just be vibrating in the bed, but albuterol shoves K in the cell. So I'm gonna give the amputy 50 because of the insulin. The insulin, the bicarb, and calcium all shift that K back into the cell. But then we give calcium, and calcium is going to maintain cellular integrity at the capillary level and continue to help contract the heart. You're changing the sodium potassium pump, so sometimes their contractility gets decreased. So that's what we would do. What the patient probably really needs, because in four hours, no matter what you do, K is going to leak out again because they're in renal failure. So what they really need is dialysis. Is dialysis. Very good. So that's hyperkalemia, and we have different things we can do for that. And there are some other drugs, but the only thing the, the test focuses on is the um, insulin, D50, insulin, bicarb, albuterol, calcium. Uh, look at calcium. Low calcium can cause torsades. Now, on the test, if you see any question about torsades, the answer is always magnesium. You're going to give mag, no problem. You're going to give magnesium. But here, low calcium can also cause it because it prolongs the QT interval. Hypercalcemia or increased serum calcium can cause asystole and that's what we see in some cancer patients because they have very high calcium, serum calcium levels. So high and low calcium looks just like magnesium. Low magnesium torsades, high asystole. So please remember, magnesium is magic. Magnesium is good for your heart, your diaphragm, your mood, your brain, your lungs. It's good for everything. It's good for everything. So we're going to stop here and take a break. This is the end of part one. So you can get up and stretch and go get another, you know, cup of coffee or whatever you need to do. And then we'll start part two, which is all the pathophysiology. So right now we've just gone over just the essentials of cardiac and now we'll start on part two and do um, uh, cardiac pathophys. Thank you.